I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the first chapter of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing an introduction to psychology. So what is psychology, a little of its history, what's going on right now, and possible careers in psychology. So let's get started with what is psychology. So in Greek, psyche means soul, and ology means the scientific study of something. So I guess that could be the study of the soul. The way we consider psychology to be today is the scientific study of the mind and behavior. And as such, it uses theories, hypotheses, and experiments. Psychology also uses the empirical method, which is unbiased observation. And the idea of unbiased observations being important goes back all the way to Aristotle. Psychology remains a very popular major. Where I teach, it's the third mo most popular major on campus, and psychology accounts for 6% of all bachelor's degrees, including some uh, famous people like Mark Zuckerberg, who was the founder of Facebook. Um, I thought he was a classics major, but I don't want to argue with your book. Well, let's get started with Wundt and structuralism, which is really when uh, psychology starts. And so Wundt is considered to be the founder of psychology. And in 1873, he publishes Principles of Physiological Psychology. And in German, physiological, the, the term physiological is really interchangeable with experimental. So you really could read that as Principles of Experimental Psychology. Now, Wundt thought that psychology was the study of conscious experience through introspection. And in German, that's referred to as Beobachtung. He established the first research lab at Leipzig, the University of Leipzig, in 1879, which you can still visit today, although it's a reconstruction. The original lab was uh, destroyed by bombing uh, during World War II. Now, structuralism was an attempt to study the structure of consciousness. And it was very tough to get any kind of agreement about conscious experience because different labs would come up with different results and then they would have to try to resolve those. William James uh, was a famous American psychologist and that's a picture of him on a trip to Brazil. I like that picture because I think he looks cool, mostly because he's wearing sunglasses in the 1870s. He was interested in Darwin's theory of evolution and how organisms adapt to their environment. So functionalism was the study of consciousness, the function of consciousness, how it adapts us to our environment. Now, he also uses introspection like Wundt, but he believed in what he called a stream of consciousness, which actually had big implications in literature. So some authors like James Joyce and William Faulkner wrote in a stream of consciousness style. But I think a way to think of this is that he viewed consciousness more holistically, which means that you couldn't break consciousness down into smaller component parts, which is really what Wundt was uh, pitching as part of psychology. Sigmund Freud, a lot of people think that Freud is psychology, but he was actually an Austrian neurologist, and he theorized that his patients' problems arose from their unconscious. And this unconscious could be accessed through dreams, which he called the royal road to the unconscious, free association, and slips of the pen or tongue, which are actually called malapropisms, but you may have heard them called Freudian slips. I famously had one in my, um, my experimental class, which I can talk about when we talk about Freud later. Now, psychoanalysis focused on the unconscious mind and childhood, and it still dominates, uh, well, it doesn't still dominate. It dominated clinical psychology for decades, but it's still used today. If you asked Freud, though, he would say really what he's doing is studying the dynamics of the unconscious. And so that was one of his big contributions. Gestalt psychology is also a school that grew up in Germany. And its major figures were Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kafka, and Wolfgang Kohler. They all immigrated to the United States because they were fleeing Nazi Germany. Now, the word Gestalt translates to whole, and the idea behind Gestalt psychology is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The school really develops as a revolt against Wundt. They used uh, perceptual 
uh, ideas like, so for example, that's a Necker cube in the picture. And it's difficult to determine, is it coming, is it projecting forward in space or is it moving backward in space? And you can see it both ways, but not both ways simultaneously. And so the ability to introspect on something like a Necker cube um, was part of their research. Gestalt psychologists have a continual influence in uh, the field of sensation and perception research. That's Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov. Does the name Pavlov ring a bell? That is one of the many horrible jokes in psychology. Uh, another one I know is, uh, how did Pavlov keep his hair soft and healthy? Classical conditioning. That's awful. John Watson, uh, and we'll talk about Pavlov more in the section on learning. John Watson was against the study of consciousness, and his idea was to shift the focus of psychology from the mind to behavior. And he thought this was because you could objectively observe behavior, but you can't observe thinking. And so therefore we shouldn't study behavior, or we shouldn't study thinking, we should study behavior because that's what we can actually observe. And he used animal experiments to study human behavior, both in his dissertation um, and encouraged it later in others. B.F. Skinner concentrated on how behavior is affected by its consequences. And he talks about the ABCs of behavior. A is for antecedent, B is behavior, and C is consequences. And his contention was that behavior is controlled by its consequences. So if you do some behavior and something good happens, you're likely to do that behavior again. And if you do some behavior and something bad happens, you're less likely to do that. So he invented the Skinner box and he's, he didn't call it that, he had called it the operant conditioning chamber or operant conditioning apparatus. So he was like to use technical terms like that. Humanism emphasizes the potential for good that's innate in humans. And uh, two, I, two theorists here, Abraham Maslow, he came up with the idea of this hierarchy of needs. And so as long as basic needs for survival were met, so physiological and safety needs, higher level needs would begin to motivate people's behavior. So love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. Now his research was mostly qualitative, meaning that he tried to find people in history who he felt were self-actualized, but there's some quantitative research that's a part of this too. Carl Rogers developed client center therapy where you don't treat people as if they're patients, you treat them as if they're clients. And the patient would take the lead role in the therapy session. The three features of this in a nutshell are unconditional positive regard. And that means that you accept the client no matter what they might say. And then also genuineness from the therapist and empathy with the problems that their client is going through. The cognitive revolution is an interdisciplinary approach which involves linguistics, neuroscience, and computer science. Now, Ulrich Neisser published his book, Cognitive Psychology in 1967. The research there was mostly qualitative, but some quantitative research too. Noam Chomsky was very influential in the early movement. He's a linguist, actually, and he's, uh, he believed that the behaviorist focus on behavior was actually short-sighted, and they we would have to reincorporate mental functioning and language into psychology in order to understand behavior. The cognitive psychologists also reestablished connections with European psychologists. Now, the um, picture there is of Nim Chimsky, who was part of really cutting edge research in the 1970s to try to teach chimpanzees uh, American Sign Language. And uh, he did, he learned a number, like, I believe like 200 signs, but um, the experiment was actually considered a failure. They named him Nim Chimsky though after Noam Chomsky. Multicultural psychology looks at the effects of culture and psychology. For example, in binge eating, people from different cultural groups seek treatment in different ways that are unique to them. Now, Francis Cecil Sumner was the first African-American to receive a PhD in psychology in 1920, and that's a picture of him to the right. Much of the early work in multicultural psychology was done in intelligence testing, 
but it now includes things like learning styles, community and belonging, and spiritualism. What about contemporary psychology? What's it like right now? Well, the American Psychological Association, or the APA, is the largest organization of psychologists in the world. And it's divided up into 56 different divisions representing a wide variety of specialties, such as psychology of religion, comparative psychology. There's a history of psychology division too. The APS, which is the Association for Psychological Science, was founded in 1988, which is fairly recently. And that was due to disagreements between experimental and clinical psychologists. Basically, many people had felt that the APA had become an association for clinical psychologists, and so experimental psychologists formed APS. Well, let's talk about some of the, the current uh, things that are studied in contemporary psychology, or, or current fields, let's say. So biopsychology is how the structure and function of the nervous system is related to behavior. And this is an interdisciplinary field also involving biologists, doctors, and neuroscientists. Evolutionary psychology, which is a course I also teach, looks at the extent that behavior is impacted by genetics. So you predict an outcome based on evolutionary theory and then make observations. So a book I use in my class is Survival of the Pretty of the prettiest, and that's by Etkoff, and I believe she's still at Harvard. But in her book, uh, she examines what makes people attractive. So facial symmetry, for example, uh, it indicates a lack of parasitic infection as a child, and therefore higher reproductive fitness. And so we see people with um, with facial with high facial symmetry as being more attractive. Now, one of the criticisms of evolutionary psychology is that these traits evolved under very different circumstances, and we have some questions about what those circumstances were. SNP and cognitive. Well, sensation perceptive and perception looks at the physiological aspects of sensory systems and the psychological experience of sensory information. So in the figure there, you can either see an old woman or a young girl, and your age is actually predictive of what you will see. So older people tend to see the old woman, younger people tend to see the younger girl. Cognitive psychology focuses on thoughts, attention, problem solving, language, and memory. I teach cognitive science also, and that's considered an interdisciplinary research field. Uh, some of my students say that I teach cognitive science fiction. Uh, I call it cognitive science inevitability. Cognitive theory is really sprinkled throughout your textbook, um, and so we'll revisit it as we go through. Developmental psychology is the study of development across the lifespan and the processes related to physical maturation. In the picture there, that's Jean Piaget, and he focused on the cognitive difference differences between very young children and adults. So for example, he comes up with this idea of object permanence, which is when we realize that things continue to exist even when they're hidden from us. Changing population demographics are is shifting really the focus in developmental to aging. So for example, by the year 2050, 90 million people in America will be 65 or older, including me. So I actually turn 84 in 2050, so please be sure to wish me a happy birthday, assuming I make it that far. Personality psychology focuses on the patterns and uh, thoughts and behaviors that make each individual unique. Now Freud hypothesized psychosexual stages of development, which we'll talk about later, but researchers now take a quantitative approach. They identify personality traits, measure them, and determine how they interact. So the big five or five factor model is very popular right now. I try to incorporate it into my research and it looks at things like openness to new experiences, conscientiousness, introversion and extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. I actually prefer the term um, neuroticism. It's, it's, it's a negative, it has a negative implication I feel. Uh, some researchers use the term stability, psychological stability. So are you good in a crisis or is everything a crisis for you?
Social psychology focuses on how we interact with and relate to others. So a famous study that was done was done by Stanley Milgram, and he did research on obedience. And what he found, and that's a, a picture from the study, is that two-thirds of participants were willing to deliver, deliver lethal shocks when they were instructed by an authority figure. And that authority figure is in the picture. It's a guy in a lab coat telling them that the experiment required that they continue delivering shocks. Now, that particular study involved deception and potential emotional harm to the people who were participating in it. And it led to the development of ethical guidelines in psychological research. Industrial organizational psychology, it's usually referred to as IO psychology. That's a subfield that applies psychological theories, principles, and research findings to business and organizations. Now, IO psychologists often work in personnel management. I have uh, several friends who do this. They act as consultants to help in hiring decisions and firing decisions. Uh, so when, when companies decide to downsize, they are uh, part of creating environments that increase employee productivity and they conduct research in business settings. Now, because it deals with business, uh, IO is probably the best paying specialty in psychology because business people are willing to pay for that. Health and sports psychology. Well, health psychology focuses on how health is affected by the interaction of biology, psychology, and society and they seek to help individuals through public policy, education, and intervention. Sports and exercise psychologists study the psychological aspects of sports and performance, and that's actually our women's basketball team here at Truman uh, with Amy Egan as the head coach. You can see them in the picture there. Now, sports psychologists might examine things like motivation, performance, anxiety, and well-being. Clinical psychology focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of psychological disorders. Now, clinical is an applied area because you're trying to solve people's real world problems, but many clinicians are active in research also. Counseling psychology is similar to clinical, but the focus is more on psychologically healthy individuals. Now, clinical and counseling receive the most attention in the popular media, and many people think that all psychology is clinical psychology. And actually, many people think that all clinical psychology is actually Freudian psychoanalysis, but that's not even close to being true. And we'll talk about that later in the semester, too. Forensic psychology focuses on psychology in the context of the legal system. And so you might assess a person's ability to stand trial, consult on child custody cases, uh, advise on eyewitness and children's testimony. Uh, you might also work in jury selection, which is called voir dire, and witness preparation. Now, criminal profilers are a small group working within law enforcement. But if you want to be a profiler, I would say don't major in psychology. Instead, you should go to acting school because you're much more likely to play a profiler on television or in the movies than you are to get a job doing that in real life. Careers in psychology. Uh, in order to work in higher education, you're probably gonna need a PhD. And that means completing a dissertation, which is when you do original research and then you defend it before a committee of expert reviewers. Being a faculty member means dividing your time between teaching, research, and service to the institution. And as a faculty member, I do all those things uh, too. Sometimes people do a postdoc, which is a postdoctoral um, uh, work, and that allows you to develop your research skills under the supervision of others in the field. And you can do a series of postdocs. It depends really on the field that you're in. Careers outside of academia. Well, you could get a PsyD, which is a Doctor of Psychology degree that puts less emphasis on research skills and more on clinical applications. Now, clinical psychologists have either a PhD or PsyD, and psychiatrists, that often gets confusing, they actually have a medical degree. And so they uh, specialize in, in um, uh, psychiatry, whereas clinical psychologists have a PhD or a PsyD. 
Now, I want to emphasize this too. Many fulfilling careers in psychology can be done with a master's degree or a bachelor's degree. A number of my students think they have to have a PhD in order to do what they want to do, and that's just not true. So things like social work, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, and school counseling are all master's or bachelor's level uh, degrees, uh, or jobs that you can do with those degrees. So I want to conclude by talking about my APA style book. So all of your problems, at least all of your APA style problems, can be solved through uh, Learn APA Style. So when you want to learn to write correctly, or write right, if you want to think of it that way, consult my books and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Thanks for listening.